Good afternoon, Commander Lloyd, Martin, guests, the men, lads, and ladies. We have a few key events for the Department of Engineering Institute, which is by the side of the National Institute of Physics. Um, I would like to extend a very welcome, um, warm welcome to all of you, and we are very lucky that we have the weather on our side for today. So, if you follow the afternoon's program, we are pleased to have Vice Chancellor for Research and Development, Dr. Fidel Armenzo, who has two delivered the lessons. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Indra. Good afternoon, and welcome to you, Kitty Man. Uh, I just want to know how many are high school students here? Um, uh, grade school? Thank you for that, um, Dr. Nemzo, 
And now we'd like to invite um, Engineer Mark and our back project one leader of the Microsoft to introduce our team. I'm Mark Palampas from the UP Electrical and Electronics Engineering Institute, and as uh, Ms. Steve's mentioned, I'm one of the project leaders for uh, the Philippine Microsoft Program, which is responsible for the one one our first uh, Philippine Microsoft Program. And today, I have the honor of introducing our guest speaker and give some background information about it. So our guest speaker was born and raised in Long Beach, California, to Filipino parents. His mom is from the Maliches, while his dad is from Ususan, Tari. City. So he attended high school at St. Louis University Laboratory High School in Baguio City and afterwards moved back to California and took up physics at the California Polytechnic Institute, uh, sorry, Polytechnic State University in Long. During his junior year, he was awarded a scholarship under NASA's Motivating Undergraduates in Science and Technology program, which included an internship at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory at JPA. So as an intern, conducted research in astrophysics and planetary science. He was eventually hired as a systems engineer in 2010, so six years ago, where he first did cost models for future missions. He has been with the Mars Science Laboratory team since January 2011 as an operations systems engineer, and his tasks included conducting training exercises for the flight team, which involved simulation of the curiosity's different cases. And he also tested operations for launch, cruise, and landing, and worked Mars time service operations with the responsibility of planning rover activities daily. So, in addition, he also tested software for the sampling system using Curiosity's twin, twin, twin test rover on Earth. So, our guest speaker now works on the Mars 2020 flight project as part of the landing team and also attends graduate school part time working on a master's in aeronautical engineering. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our guest speaker for today, Junior Gregorio Pagano to the Art of Third from NASA's Jet Propulsion Labs. Human exploration operations, 
on directory. And so when people think of NASA, they usually think of this directory, which is where you know, the astronauts in space in the space station or going to the moon a few years ago. And NASA also has the space technology directory. So they are responsible for developing the technology that we need to do our science and our aeronautics and human exploration. They're kind of furthering the technology needed for each of these directories. So there are a lot of NASA centers across the US. Uh, most people think about the one in Houston, the Johnson Space Flight Center. That is where the astronauts train. Now, if you guys see the movie Apollo 11, you know how you say Houston, we have a problem. That's because mission, usually Michigan Patrol is in Houston, so it's in Houston. Uh, another famous site, NASA site, is the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. So whenever you see launches, usually they're from the Kennedy Space Center. Also, a very important one, in Washington, D.C., we have headquarters. So that's where all the corporate officials are for NASA. Now, in California, there are three centers, and I work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. All of the centers have their own specialty, and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory um, is in California. So it's a little special, and we kind of like it. JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, is managed by the California Institute of Technology, one of the leading technical institutions in the world. Um, it's usually, if you guys heard of MIT, MIT is on the East Coast, Caltech is on the West Coast. So we have Caltech that manages JPL for NASA. So it's a little confusing, but it's very nice that I can be affiliated with JPL, Caltech, and NASA. This is what JPL looks like. It's in Pasadena, California. Uh, it's about, if you guys know about Disneyland, has, has anyone been to Disneyland before? A few of you, okay. JPL is actually twice the size of Disneyland. It's really, really big. And there are about 5,000 employees at any given time. So, like I said, a lot of the centers have their own specialties. And JPL is, is responsible for solar system exploration. So we build the satellites, the spacecraft, the rovers that go to Mars, other planets, and also satellites that study our Earth, and satellites that study our Sun, other planets in the solar system, and also just bodies across the universe. So that is JPL's specialty. So the talk of today, or the topic of today's talk, actually can we zip the lights a little bit? So today we're going to be talking about the Mars rover Curiosity. So in 2012, there was this really big event. It was, um, it was actually published at Times Square Live. Where we landed the largest, most capable rover we've ever sent to Mars. Curiosity is the size of a car, about 1,000 kilos, and there are a lot of instruments on here. It's also the first nuclear-powered rover. So previous rovers, and when I say rover, I just mean a robot that, that moves on wheels, because we, could, we also have landers, which are just robots that don't, they, they don't move around, they just land and they do science where they are. It's the first nuclear-powered rover. All the previous rovers, like Pathfinder and Spirit and Opportunity, they were solar-powered. Have you guys seen the, has, who has seen the Martian movie? Martian? Oh, no, you guys should watch it. It's an awesome movie. I've seen it six times. Um, anyway, so there's, in the movie, Matt Damon goes and digs up a rover so he can talk to Earth, right? That rover is Pathfinder. J that is a real thing. JPL built, built and operated Pathfinder. That's where I work. And actually, you can see snippets of JPL in the movie. So I work there. Anyway, um, this is the Mars Science Laboratory. That's the name of the project. And the rover's name is Curiosity. And so, like I said, there's a bunch of instruments. Um, you can see there's a head here with um, weather instrumentation, so it can detect wind speeds and temperature and humidity. There are a total of 17 cameras on the rover. I'm not going to show you all of them, but there's an obvious one here. And actually, this eyeball-looking part is a laser, too. So we have a laser that can shoot rocks and soil. And when you see kind of like the smoke that comes off, we can analyze the composition of the, the materials on Mars. 
It also has a really long arm. It's about seven feet, 200 pounds. Um, and at the tip of the arm, it has a bunch of instruments as well. It has a drill, it has a scoop, it has cameras. There's a lot of instruments here. So we'll be talking about this today. And the main purpose of Curiosity was to determine if life could live on Mars. Not if life existed on Mars, but if life did exist on Mars, will it survive? And within the, um, within the primary mission, the team has determined that life would have been able to live on Mars. So mission accomplished. OK, so how do we get to Mars? There are several, in a project, there are several phases. And this is the launch phase. So remember, I said earlier, we do most of our launches from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. So this was November, I think it was two nights, so maybe like November 27, 2011. So the rover is inside of this spacecraft, which we'll talk about a little more. This spacecraft is, goes inside of this shell, which is called a fairing. And this fairing is what you see up here. So this is the actual rocket that launched the Curiosity rover to Mars. Um, so something to point out here is there are a lot of organizations and people and teams that are involved with operating at every phase. So for launch specifically, there is the United Launch Alliance. They're kind of partnered with NASA. And they handle a lot of the launches for spacecraft, not just the Mars rovers. And so NASA goes to the United Launch Alliance and says, can we buy a rocket so we can put a spacecraft into Earth orbit or to Mars or to Jupiter? And they say, OK. So there's a team of engineers from JPL at JPL in Pasadena. There's also a team of engineers at, or in Florida for the launch. And so what happens is that we have a team at Florida monitoring the health of the spacecraft before we launch. So they're making sure the power is OK, the thermal is OK, also the software is OK. They make sure everything's OK. And the moment of liftoff, oh, also, um, before we launch, we actually take um, poles. So we pull every what we call subsystems or specialties. So they'll say power. Power will say, yes, 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 go. Thermal, go. Telecom, go. And there's a whole, maybe like hundreds of you know, queues that we go to. And when everyone says go, they do the liftoff. Three, two, one, lift off. And then the control goes from Florida to Pasadena, kind of like mission control for the astronauts, right? Like I said, mission control was in Houston for the astronauts. Mission control for the rover is in Pasadena, California. So we lift off. Then we enter the cruise phase of the mission. Cruise is just the journey from Earth to Mars, OK? For Curiosity, it took about seven or eight months. Um, it's a long time, we'll talk about, uh, because for sending spacecraft to Mars, you usually only do that once every two years or so, because Earth and Mars are going around the sun, and sometimes they're on opposite sides of the sun. So you don't want to send the spacecraft when they're on opposite sides, because you'll need more fuel, and so that's not efficient. So this happens every two years or, two years or so. Um, and so we launched, and now we're in the cruise phase. So the rover, again, is inside of this spacecraft. This is called the back shell. And then the brown cover is called the heat shield, which I will talk about in a bit. This is called the aero shell. And the aero shell is connected to this disk structure. So you can kind of see the solar panels. I told you the rover is nuclear powered, but during cruise, it's solar powered. So we have batteries on the spacecraft. The solar panels charge the batteries. That's how we go through space. Also on the spacecraft, there are these thrusters or like little jets. So we have two sets of jets with four thrusters, small, four smaller jets. And so going through space, we have to move around our orientation and we have to move in space because when we launch, we actually aim away from Mars. We don't aim to Mars because whenever you send spacecraft to other planets, you have to be worried about planetary protection. And that just means that you don't want to send things you do not plan to send to Mars. So for example, if 
the launch vehicle, the rocket that launched us, um, for example, say we could not control that when we launch, we don't want it to smash into Mars. That's why we aim away from Mars, and then when everything's okay, we use a spacecraft to slowly move our way towards Mars. So that's why we do that. Also, during our journey to Mars, we have to make sure that the spacecraft is pointed towards Earth and pointed towards the sun at the same time. So if that's the Earth and it's the sun, every time I'm moving, I have to make sh sure I see both because I have to be pointed towards the Earth so I can communicate with Earth. And I have to position the solar panels towards the sun so I can get power. OK, so eight, seven or eight months go by. Or, you know, we're going through space, going to Mars. And then we enter the most nerve-wracking phase of the mission. Entry, descent, and landing. So this is very, 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 very scary moment for all of us. This is when we had to get the rover that's traveling at 13,000 miles an hour down to zero in just seven minutes. So that's very, very, very complicated. What happens, so first we separate the crew stage. Remember the structure with the solar panels and the jets? We take that off and we enter the Martian atmosphere. And that slows us down a little bit. So for example, say you're in a car and you, you're stepping on the gas. If you let go of the gas and don't push the brake, you will slow down, right, because of the air. Something similar to that. Um, so that's what we did, kind of, you know, we go into the atmosphere and it slows us down. While you're doing that, though, it heats up because you're going through the atmosphere. So earlier I mentioned we had a heat shield, and that's why we have a heat shield, because it'll get really, really hot and we have to be protected by the heat shield. So this gets us down to about 900 miles per hour, and that's still really fast, so we don't want to hit the surface at 900 miles an hour. So we then use a really, really big parachute. It's a supersonic parachute because we, de we deploy it at supersonic conditions. So we're on this parachute. It gets us down to about 200 miles per hour, still very fast. So then we come down on rockets. The rover has its own jetpack. So you can see kind of here, um, we, we open up the heat shield. The heat shield is now gone. The rover separates from here, and it falls down. And the first thing we do is turn on the jetpacks and go to the side, because we don't want to hit the parachute and the back shell. So we fly to the side first, and then we start to come down. And then when we're about 60 feet from the ground, the jetpack lowers the rover on cables. Okay, so it, it, And this is called the sky crane configuration. Helicopters on Earth deliver packages like this, and that's where kind of the concept came from. So when the rover touches down, the, the jetpack will, will sense, it will know that it touches the ground, and it will cut the cables and fly away, away from the rover, away from where we want to go, because the jetpack has fuel. So we don't want it to go to where we're going to do science. It will contaminate our science site. It goes away. So this is what happens in seven minutes. Very complicated. Um, if you guys have not seen this landing, I have footage of it on the next slide. Hopefully the audio. Do we have audio? So I'm going to go to the next slide. Oh, the audio is not working. Can you turn on the audio? There you go. Okay, cool. Thank you. Things are looking good. Coming up on entry. Vehicle reports entry interface. We are beginning to feel the atmosphere as we go in here. Uh, it is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 or G's. Starting. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. Parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. 
Speech up have separated, we're on the ground expand. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers per second. Standing by for batch on separation. We are in hard flight. We're at altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky green. Sky green is starting. Single dive, you remain strong. Okay, so that's what happened on August 5th or 6th here, 2012. Um, but I actually have one more video. So you noticed a lot of people were just jumping up and down, very happy. And sometimes people think, well, why are they so happy, right? Well, you have to think about, they, it takes about 10 years to lead up to that event, right? It takes about five years to build the rover, do the testing. Um, it takes a year to get there. And then, you know, it, it's a long time. People devote their lives to these projects. They spend, sometimes they spend their weekends and their vacations away from their family and they just work really hard on this project because they love what they do. And so when you see something like that successfully happen, it's very emotional. And that's why people you know, cry or jump up and down. The next video I'm gonna show you, um, that was actually just one room in landing. I, I was in another room, which you will see here. Um, but the whole point of this presentation is for you to see how many people are involved in such operations. There were people in a lot of different rooms. It wasn't just that main room, okay? So before I start the next video, I want to tell you something. Um, the guy who was kind of narrow, um, telling the sequence of events, did you hear he was saying, like, this is happening, this is happening? That's Alan Chen. He, I work for him now. He's a very, very smart guy. But did you hear, hear him say, touchdown confirmed? Okay. Before he said that, we actually had a checklist of things to make sure that it is okay. He did not just say touchdown confirmed when he saw it work, because we wanted to make sure that we were sure. So there were three things. One was the, um, the computer, the rover can sense when it touches something. So there's a signal that was sent to Earth saying, you know, I've touched down. So that's first check. The second thing we had is a, um, we had a sensor on board. So the rover can touch down, but it could be sliding or it could be rolling over, and that's not good. So there's a sensor on board that tells us that it's stable. So when we saw that that was not moving, that's the next check. The last one, so do you remember the jetpack? So the rover could touch down, be stable, but the jetpack could, could have smashed on the rover, right? And so we would know that if we could not communicate with the rover. So the last check was to make sure that we are still receiving communication. So the point of that is that in this next scene, we heard the first indication, which was the rover touchdown. But we were told not to react. So we were already excited for 30 seconds, but we couldn't move because we weren't, we knew that the rover touched down, but we had to wait for touchdown confirmed. Okay, so I'm gonna show this one minute clip, see if you can find me. Take a dot 
that, that was the first sign. So we're just kind of holding out our excitement. Mars now. Okay, here we go. So now we're on the surface. Uh, we did launch, which was we got it off of Earth. We did cruise, we traveled to Mars. We did EDL, entry, descent, and landing. And now we begin the surface, or we began the surface phase of the mission. There's a lot of places to go on Mars, a lot of interesting places. This project, Curiosity, ended up at Gale Crater. So it's this really big crater on Mars about nine miles long. And in the middle of the crater, there is a mountain, Mount Sharp. So geologists chose this landing site because like the Grand Canyon on Earth, or anything like the Grand Canyon on Earth, geologists can study the history of a planet by looking at the layers. So these are kind of the layers of Mount Sharp. So that's why this site was interesting. There are a lot of sites interesting for different reasons. But this is why we went here. OK, so rover operations, the, the meat of my talk. I'm going to explain to you how we operated a rover on Mars for the first three months. Okay, It's very comprehensive. There's a lot of people involved, a lot of facilities involved, a lot of, there's a lot involved. And that's what I kind of want to show all of you. So the first thing we need to understand is, like I said earlier, Earth and Mars are going around the sun. And it takes anywhere from 4 to 20 minutes for a signal to reach the two planets. So what that means is, when I turn on my laser, when I turn on my laser pointer, when I push the button, you see it almost immediately, right? But if I pointed this to Mars, when I turn it on, you would not see the light on, if it reaches, if you can see it. It would not be there for 4 to 20 minutes, depending how far they are. So the reason why this is important is because we can't just tell the rover to go forward and then stop, right? Because if we say drive and we see a cliff or a hole and we say stop, it won't stop for 4 to 20 minutes. So the way we operate the rover is we send it some instructions for the day, a little bit, it will do the work, and then, be, and then at nighttime it will go to sleep, but send us back what it did. And then we'll, we'll plan. We'll say, oh, this is what happened. Let's do this. So we do little at a time. We don't just, you know, it's not like a remote control car or a video game. OK? So another thing to keep in mind is that the rover operates during the daytime. I told you earlier that the rover is nuclear powered. So it doesn't need the sun to operate. But we still operate mostly during the day. And that's because when you move things on Mars, you have to heat it up, right? It's like stretching. You need to warm yourself up. You can't just move cold. And so we operate during the day because it's really, really, really cold at night. So it would not be efficient to be operating at night, although we do some things at night. So like I said, we send up a signal to the rover. It wakes up. It does its operations. And before it goes to sleep, it will tell us what happened. And that's when we spend 17 hours planning and creating new instructions for the rover so that the next day we can tell it to operate. Okay? But this is Mars time. Mars time is different from Earth time. One day on Earth is one rotation of the Earth. That takes 24 hours, right, on Earth. On Mars, it takes 24 hours and 40 minutes. So the reason why that's important is because when we landed on August 6, people started working at 1 in the morning. But the week later, people started working at 4 in the morning. And then the week later is 8 in the morning, and then noon, and then 4. So for three months, our schedule was moving. Very, it was very disorienting. But it was fun, you know. Um, we actually, back on the previous rover's um, Spirit and Opportunity that landed in 2003 or 2004, 
um, there was a local watch shop that made Mars time watches. So people wore two watches, Earth watch and Mars watch. <laughs> but for curiosity, we're in the different age, right? So we actually had apps. So some of our software engineers built Mars time apps. So we just, you know, we had a Mars, Mars time and Earth time. Okay, so here we go. Like I said, it's not just one person with a joystick moving. There's a lot involved. So we'll go through that right now. Sometimes when you think about operating something, you think of the control room, right? Once again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of people and rooms involved. Um, here you see about 50 engineers on their computers, but you will see in the presentation that there are more rooms and more people involved in operating a rover. So here's what happens on a daily basis when we're operating the rover on Mars. Like I said, the rover is operating. It could shoot its laser, it could drill a rock, it could drive. I forgot to mention, there are actual laboratories inside the rover that we can use to determine what certain rocks and sand, and the sand and the soil are made of. So we could use those instruments inside and kind of see what, what things are made of. And before it goes to sleep, it sends us data. But the data doesn't go straight to Earth. So here's Mars, here's Earth. There are satellites going around Mars. We call them orbiters. And these orbiters, they take pictures of the planet, they take measurements of the planet. But in addition to that, they record the data from, from some of our spacecraft on the planet. So when they're going around and they see the rover, they make a connection with the rover and they start recording the data. When they're done recording and they see the Earth, they play back that data to Earth. So that's how we get information from Mars most of the time. You'll start to see this counter. So I try to estimate how many people are involved in this step of the process. So there's 50 people here because these satellites are their own spacecraft. They have their own spacecraft team. So on, on any given day, there's about 25 people operating these spacecraft. OK, so um, data comes down from the satellites to Earth, and then it goes to these satellite dishes. This is called the Deep Space Network, Deep Space Network, or the DSN. And we have these satellite dishes in three places around the world. And that's because if you can imagine my eyes are these satellites and I'm the Earth moving, there's always a part of the sky that I can't see. So we want to make sure we have eyes all over so we can see all the spacecraft in the universe. Uh, so yes, yeah, so we put them in three equally, roughly equally distant locations on Earth so we can see all the spacecraft. This is a resource that's used by not just Curiosity, but almost all of the spacecraft in outer space. And so, you know, there's a lot of people maintaining the satellite dishes, but for a specific project, there's about five people kind of making sure the project's data is coming down. So the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, in addition to building satellites and the rovers, we are also responsible for managing the deep space network these set of satellites. So no matter what project it is, whether it's um, spacecraft in Jupiter or the Sun or Mars or some other spacecraft, every data that comes down through the DSN, whether it's in California or Australia or Spain, all of the data comes back to JPL first. And then it gets distributed to the projects. Because not all of the projects are at JPL. They could be at other NASA centers, at universities, another space institution across the world, but all of the data comes back to JPL first. So once, oh, so once again, for curiosity, um, there's about five people for the, wait, helping us get the, the curiosity data down from the satellite dishes. OK, so from this point, we had 17 hours to look at the data, figure out what we want to do the next day, and then send instructions back to curiosity. So here's what happens. Now we have a timer. We have 100 engineers and scientists looking at the data, making sure that it's all good, making sure the rover is healthy. We have people looking at our battery, the power, 
people looking at our heaters, um, people are looking at data. There's a lot of, I don't know if you know who this is, this is data from Star Trek, but um, the rover generates a ton of data. It takes pictures, it drives, and the whole time it's creating all this data and we can't bring it all back to Earth all at once. So we have a data management team that understands what's on the rover, what we brought back, and kind of managing that. But at the same time, there are hundreds of scientists. The rover had um, 10 different science instruments from different institutions from around the world. So during the first three months, the science team came to JPL. There were, I think, on the order of 400 scientists at JPL in addition, in addition to the engineering team. So we look at the data for about an hour and a half. And then we all get together. It's, this is called the Science Operations Working Group. So there is a representative from each instrument, from each rover specialty. There's about 80 people in this room. And we go around getting like one minute updates, saying like, are you OK? What happened? Then just go around the room. Um, and, and then we plan. We plan the next day. There are a lot of things the rover can, can do. It can drill rocks. Um, it can, you know, take pictures. Oh, and by the way, you know, something like drilling a rock takes days and even weeks to plan. It doesn't just like, let's use the drill, you know. It, there's a lot involved. So it has cameras. I said there are 17 different cameras. We have cameras for science measurement. We have cameras to see where we're driving. I also mentioned that the rover has scientific labor laboratories inside. So we can put soil or rocks inside of the rover, and we can kind of process the samples to see what, the, what it's made of. Or we can drive. The rover, people think that we drive really fast on Mars. It's, it's pretty slow. So we have to monitor it, make sure it's not going to run into cliffs or you know, rock, big rocks or anything like that. That's me again. So um, for surface operations, I was a science planner. So what that means is, I, my station is controlling these screens that everyone is looking at. You see these screens? So my job was to manage the plan. So what that looks like, um, just look at the pretty colors and stuff. But what this is, is for every thing we want the rover to do, there's a line, right? So we'll say, wake up or do some science. But the point of this slide is to show you that it helps us organize our thoughts for the day. So it does a few things, right? For example, you don't want, you cannot drive and shoot your laser at the same time. So if we put those two activities together, the tool will tell us, you can't do that. It will flag us down. So it does that for thousands of types of activities, right? The rover can do plenty of things. So this tool helps us manage to make sure we're not doing two things or three things together that we can't. In addition to that, this tool models our power consumption. So every day we have a certain power allocation or how much power we can use. And so if we put too many activities, the tool will tell us you're using too much energy. And also it does things like manage our data. So when we take pictures, we know how much data each picture is or when we, when we do analysis. So again, this tool will tell us how much data we generate and what's left on board. So my job for the first three months on Mars was to kind of manage this on a daily basis with a team of other people. Okay. All right. So about nine and a half hours go by. We have a plan. We've talked with the engineers and scientists for that long. People, you know, are arguing. What I want to do this. I want to do that. We can't do this. The rover can't. Blah blah. You know. And though, so that's about ten hours, and people are tired. So we have to switch the team. There's a new team that comes. The first team leaves, the second team comes in, and their job is to turn these plans into sequences, right? This is just a picture. If we sent this to the rover, the rover doesn't know what to do. It's just a picture with colors and bars. So the next team com comes in, and they turn every single line into sequences, like computer commands. So this is a very, very simple one. It just says, rover, wake up. Extend your arm two meters, place the drill on the rock, drill one millimeter, bring your arm back, go to sleep. There's actually thousands, tens of thousands of lines like this every day. I'm just giving you a simple example. Um, and so we have people, engineers and 
for every line, there is a team of engineers or scientists making these sequences. And then there's one or two people who bring it all together and transform it into what the rover understands, which is binary. So this is the bundle that we eventually send up, the ones and zeros. That's what the rover understands. OK, so of course, like in school, every time you do homework or your test, you check your work, right? And sometimes when you're doing projects at home, you have other people look at your work. Um, and then you, know, you check it again. And then you have more people look at your work. This is a very expensive mission. Um, so we check a lot. We make sure that everyone is looking at what we're doing. Curiosity, the Mars Science Laboratory costs uh, about $2.5 billion. Um, but that includes building it, go, sending it to Mars, operating it. And that sounds like a lot of money, but you know, in, this, in, this, in the picture, the, the grand picture of the government, NASA actually only has less than a percent of the national, of the American budget. So, you know, but still a lot of money, so we have to make sure that everything is okay. In order to help that, we have facilities called test beds, test beds, and all that means is that they are simulation environments. So, for example, this is a twin rover that we have at JPL. This is exact size of the rover that's on Mars. It has the same flight software as the rover on Mars. It pretty much is a du duplicate, um, minus, for example, the, the, the nuclear power source. You know, um, we actually attach it, we plug it in. But before we send anything to the rover on Mars, we always check it here on Earth first. We don't want to send the commands to the rover for the first time, right? We, we test it hundreds, if not thousands of times on Earth before we send it to Mars. This over here is another type of simulation environment. It's a rover, but without a body. And that's because this is used by the mobility team, the team that drives, to see um, what the rover is capable of doing in terms of inclined planes or big rocks. And the reason why you don't see the body is because it's supposed to be the same, it's supposed to weigh the same as it does on Mars. So, you know, weight is dependent on gravity. Gravity on Mars is less than on Earth. So this mock-up on Earth weighs about the same as it does on Mars. So that's another environment. Okay, so now we've gone through 15 and a half hours, hundreds of people. We saw what happened yesterday. We planned for tomorrow, we turned it into sequences, we checked what we did, now it's time to go to management so they can approve it. We, kind of, we walk them through everything that we've done and there's a few management who kind of looks at what we've done and tells us, okay, that is okay to go. So then everyone's back on their stations, they're looking at the rover, making sure everything is still good before we send the next set of instructions because if something happened, we don't want to send instructions, right? So everyone's checking first. And then we send the commands back to the deep space network. Remember the satellites that I showed you? And we send the signal from the satellite directly to the rover. So we don't have to go through those orbit. Remember there were orbiters that were going around Mars to get the data back? We don't have to do that when we send instructions because the instructions are very small compared to the massive data that we have to bring back. That's why we need the orbiters so they can record the data and send it back to Earth. Okay, so to summarize, there were about 50 people operating the spacecraft that go around Mars to get the data. There are about five people, the Deep Space Network, DSN, helping us get the data from space to the satellite dishes. There are about five engineers at JPL processing that data once it got to JPL. Then we had 100 engineers, scientists, a bunch of people looking at the data for about an hour and a half. And then we added 40 more people to plan for the next day, right? What do we want to do? And then after that, about 10 hours go by, they go home, a new set of people come in to turn the plans into sequences so the rover can understand that. Then we review what we've done with our management. And then we have a new set of people on station to make sure the rover is still OK before we send the commands back. And then a new set of deep space network people to 
uplink the commands back to the rover. So if you do this quick math, you get 265. There are about 265 people every day operating a rover on Mars. But wait, we can't have the same people working seven days a week for three months, right? So really, you have to multiply that number by two because in the middle of the week, you know, we'll have a, someone will have their weekend and the new team will come in. But people also want to take vacations or people might get sick. So you really have to multiply that number by three for, for backups. So when you add this all up, do the multiplication, it took over 800 people to operate the Curiosity rover on Mars. And that's you know, something that I never really appreciated and it was really amazing to be part of that experience. I feel very fortunate to be part of all of these teams, seeing all of these processes and operations and working with some of the smartest people in the world. So that's what it took to operate a rover on Mars, and I will now share with you how I got to be part of this team, which was very, very fortunate for me. So it all started when I was a baby. Um, <laughs> growing up, I wanted, I looked up to one of my cousins, and every time he said, I wanted to be a lawyer, I said, I wanted to be a lawyer. I want to be a doctor, I want to be a doctor. But at some point, um, he said he wanted to be an astronomer, and I said, oh, okay, I don't know what that is, but I want to be an astronomer. And I realized that that is, you know, someone who studies the stars. So, as mentioned earlier, I went to high school in Baguio City. This is proof that I, I actually went to Baguio City. I went to St. Louis University Laboratory High School. At the time, the nickname was Boys High. Um, and at the time, you know, I was very good at math and science, and I competed in, I think it was the PMO the Philippine Math Olympiad, and every time there were math or science competitions, I represented our class for those, for those categories. But one of my classmates who I really look up to, um, Raymond Kaluza, he was um, very, he was going into law, and he was really good at debating. So I joined the debate team, he kind of taught me how to debate a little bit, and I was like, oh, I want to do law. So when I graduated, my mind was set to do law. And so I went back to the States. I was studying accounting and pre-law. Um, and then when I got my associate's degree, which is a degree in the States that you get after two years, I had a talk with my mom and one of my uncles. And they sat me down and they said, you know, Gregory, you don't have to do law if you don't want to do law. You know, you're smart. You can do whatever you want. So I thought about it. And I said, oh, OK, I'm going to switch majors. So instead, I switched to physics. After two years of college and already got my associate's degree, I started all over. So I spent another four years getting my bachelor's degree in physics. And as some of you may know, physics is a very broad field. There's quantum mechanics, there's astrophysics, there's electrodynamics. There's a lot of things to choose from. And I specialized in astrophysics. So when I was a sophomore, second year college, one of my professors said, hey, one of my previous students as a research opportunity for you. I said, oh, cool, what, what is it? So we went down um, in the San Diego area, which is two hours from JPL. And I was very fortunate to use this telescope. This telescope, which is inside of this dome, is two stories high. It's a really, really big telescope. Up in the mountains, where it's dark, and I remember the first night I went in pitch black, I stepped in the center of the dome, and it was pitch black, and these were still closed, so no light came in. And I heard the motors turning, right, it was like opening slowly, and the moonlight, the moonlight shined into the dome and illuminated the telescope. And I, and I was like, oh my gosh, this huge telescope, I've never seen a telescope this big. And I got to use this telescope for two nights over the weekend, and I said, I want to do this for the rest of my life. Astronomy, right? Well, the next two years was spent processing this data. It wasn't as fun as those two nights of using the telescope. Once you get the data, you have to process, you know, do all this math and, you know, write papers. Uh, so I thought about it, and I realized that, it, um, you know, maybe this isn't for me. But I continued, and as mentioned, I got a NASA scholarship. And that came with a internship at a NASA center of my choice. So I chose the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Pasadena. I spent two years studying, well, I spent a year and a half studying planetary nebula. 
all that is is one of the end states of a star. So um, our sun is a star. Stars can die in one of several ways, one of which is planetary nebula. They can turn to black holes or supernovas. I study these pretty clouds in the sky using data from Hubble. There's the Hubble Space Telescope. I don't know if you've heard of that. I also use data from the Spitzer Space Telescope. And once again, I was you know, looking at pretty pictures, processing data. And I also spent half a year studying Jupiter. So there were telescopes in Hawaii. Um, I didn't get to go to Hawaii, sadly. But I was able to control the telescopes in Hawaii from JPL. You know, we're in the future now. So I did this for two years. And you know, it was fun. It was cool whenever I got to use the telescopes. But it wasn't really for me. My mentors, um, geniuses, they love what they do. You know, they love the observations and processing data. But it wasn't for me. Um, actually, one of my, my mentors, he said he knew that he wanted to do planetary science when he was seven years old or something. Like planetary science specifically as a seven-year-old. And, and today he's actually one of the leading planetary scientists in the world. So, and he drives, he races Porsche, so it's pretty cool. He's like 70-something, but still races his Porsche in the racetrack. Um, okay, so um, I graduated. I did internship for two years. And I didn't know what I wanted to do. I actually applied to um, graduate school in planetary science. I did not get in. And so I didn't know what I was going to do. I was like, what am I going to do? And um, I'm at JPL. I wrote a cover letter, built a resume, and emailed it to 200 supervisors at JPL individually, not CC, carbon copy. Like individually sent 200 emails saying, hey, I'm a phys I just graduated in physics. I did research in astrophysics for two years. I don't like what I'm doing right now. I want to try engineering. So half of them contacted me saying, oh, sorry, you have a really impressive resume, but you're not a good fit for our group. Um, two people called me in for an interview, and only one hired me out of the 200 emails I sent out. So I spent, I got hired as a systems engineer. I spent the first six months developing cost models. All that means is before NASA builds any project, we have to estimate how much it will cost, right? We don't just build stuff. So I you know, made a little tool or a small part of the estimation. I did that for six months. But six months later, I got, to, I got hired onto the Mars Science Laboratory, which was very, very, very fortunate for me. And as part of the Mars Science Laboratory, I got to do a lot of different things. In the introduction, you heard that we tested operations. That was the main thing I did. So our team um, coordinated test rehearsals, like dress rehearsals of critical events, like launch and entry, descent, and landing, and service operations. Um, so I did that for about a year and a half. I did some testing on the rover. I was part of the entry, descent, and landing team. And I got to, I got to meet a lot, of, a lot of different people and work with a lot of brilliant people. So I feel very, very fortunate be part of this really amazing project. So I did this for, um, we landed, I spent 200 SOLs, 200 Martian days, surface operations, and I wanted to try something different. And at the time, NASA was very impressed with curiosity that they told JPL to build another rover. So now, I work on the Mars 2020 rover as, as part of the entry, descent, and landing team. So you remember the team that gets us to the surface of Mars? I'm on that team now. and so. I'm very happy because when I was working on Curiosity, that group of engineers, I always said, Man, they're so cool. Like, they're so smart. I want to I wanna be on that team. And you know, after bugging people over and over, can I please be on your team? They let me on their team. So now I work for the guy who was, kind of narr who was telling the steps of EDL, Al Chen, and one of the smartest guys I know. I don't understand how smart he is. Um, and these are pictures. Um, you know, we're, I got, I'm getting to see the hardware built from the beginning. These are instrumentation that we use for, for entry, descent, and landing. So we have a Mars yard at JPL where we do testing of these sensors. We, act, we also put the sensors on helicopters so we can bring them to the desert that kind of resemble Martian environments. Um, this is me in, the, in a clean room suit. This is the descent stage, the jetpack that, that the rover is attached to. This is the actual jetpack that will be lowering the rover in 2021. And I'm in there. And the reason why we're in these suits is because we have to make sure that the spacecraft is clean. I think I have one more slide. 
Um, this is me in the world's largest wind tunnel. So wind tunnels are just really big rooms with really large electric fans blowing really fast. <laughs> and this is the largest one in the world. Um, to give you a sense of scale, this is 80 feet high and 120 feet across. These, the fans, there are six fans, and each of the fans are 40 feet high. So they're really, really big fans. And I like to say that we were testing a Mars parachute in the world's largest wind tunnel. So that was really, really cool. And this is part of the cool things that I get to do in my job. Get to do, go to see different facilities, do different testing. And the last picture I have here is me with the heat shield. Remember I told you we cover the spacecraft so that when we're going through the atmosphere, we don't burn up. So this is the actual heat shield that will be flying on Mars. So it's really cool that I get to touch all this hardware. Anyway, so um, last picture here. These are pictures pictures taken by the Curiosity rover a few minutes after it landed. There's me very, very happy. Like I said, we were bottling up all of our, our emotions. And, you know, I just feel very blessed and fortunate to be able to, you know, come go through life and be able to end up where I am today, where I'm in a job which doesn't feel like a job and it's something that I really love. So hopefully one day, you know, you guys can do really well in engineering or science and, you know, be part of whether it's NASA or I think the Philippines is starting to establish their first space agency, you know, you guys can make history for the Philippines and build maybe the first rover or satellite going to Mars. That's it. Thank you. So, um, Hello. Um, thank you, um, Sir Gregory, for that um, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Now it's time for our Q and A. So, if you guys have any questions, don't be shy. <laughs> Um, good afternoon, sir. Um, I am I am from the social sciences. I guess I am the only one in social sciences here. I'm, I'm a sociologist, a faculty member from the Department of Sociology. Um, I think uh, I don't know if this is a question, and I think it's not the first time that you will be hearing ab uh, about this. Um, of course, when when you're in that kind of project, it takes like ten years. It will take a lot of um, resources sources like money involved okay and yeah I think it will not be the first time that you will be hearing comments like um, there's an opportunity cost always of course we want to use resources as equitable as possible um, and there are you know opportunity costs like you can have used that uh, resources for your feeding children in Africa or or let's say um, giving medicines or you know um, education for your children prisoners etc um, I just wanted to hear from someone from NASA telling us why is it worth where what we're trading it for thank you so something that we try to tell people is um, so I'm going to use the US budget as an example because I don't you know I don't really I'm not aware of the Philippine budget but actually everything NASA does is less than 1% of the overall American budget. So I think we're getting a lot in return, right? It's like saying, if you have $100, we're using like one cent of it just to build, not just curiosity, but everything NASA does. And so, you know, it's beyond me to understand, you know, where the money's going to help, you know, like poverty or, or education. But the only thing I can say is that NASA is operating on a very, 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 very small amount of money um, relative to the overall national budget. So I do agree that, you know, it's, I think it's within the politicians' responsibilities to kind of divvy up where the money goes. But as far as the U.S. is concerned, NASA has very, 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 very small budget. It's going to other places. And I think, I don't know what the education budget is, but I'm, I'm sure it's, you know, I, I don't know, I, I would imagine it's more than like NASA. And, you know, it's also, what we like to do say is that NASA, when we when we build spacecraft like Curiosity or satellites, we're also we're also developing technology which helps, Earth, right? Whether it's um, communications or technologies for third world countries, right? Like plumbing systems. Um, one of my friends, he, I actually took over for him in 2020. He's a great guy, a brilliant guy. He left um, JPL 
um, after landing Curiosity to go work in a company that uses engineering practices to help third world countries. So he's actually saving the world now. He landed a rover on Mars, now he's saving the world. So I, I guess the point is that NASA, when we build stuff, it's not just for space exploration, which is, we should be doing that, right, to further our curiosity and our presence in the overall universe. But we're actually, every time we do something, we're building technology to help us on Earth, too, on very little money compared to the overall budget. So I think that's a good thing to keep in mind. Good question, though. Here we go. Hi, I'm David. Uh, I'm I'm mechanical. I'm taking up mechanical engineering, and I just wanted to ask. Recently, SpaceX has launched another resupply mission for NASA. Do you, as a JPL engineer, feel threatened by the rise of SpaceX? That's a common question. Um, actually, no. We um, SpaceX and JPL have very different objectives. SpaceX right now are into the um, launch vehicle, the launch vehicles, and the resupply missions. JPL is focused on solar system exploration. Completely different things. Like the NASA centers, they all have their own specialty. Although SpaceX is planning to go to Mars, I think in 2018, they're trying to send their first spacecraft, which is really exciting. And actually, no one at JPL that I know of see them as competition. We see it as we're all in the space industry together. We're like we're one human, right? It's not SpaceX, JPL, Lockheed Martin, or whatever. Like we're all doing this for the for the sake of space. And actually, SpaceX consults with JPL for areas that they're not, they're still starting, right? So like entry, descent, and landing, that's one of our specialties. So they ask us for certain things. They consult with us. Um, but they're doing amazing things. And I have friends who work there. Sometimes people move between JPL and SpaceX or some other company and come back. So we kind of, it's, I feel like it's one human race trying to get to explore the rest of the universe. But yeah, they're, they're doing awesome stuff. We always watch what they're doing. It's great. Uh, hi. Uh, 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 what? Like, uh, academic path or plan do you recommend to like me or other people who also aspire to have such job, job as yours? Thank you. Sorry, can you, can you please repeat the question? <laughs> hello, hello. Uh, what academic path or plan do you recommend? like us who aspire to have such jobs. Uh, okay, so um, as Vice Chancellor said earlier, he dreamed of being an astronaut, and I also want to be an astronaut. And that is a common question that people applying for astronauts, you know, ask is what should we, what field should we go into? And NASA usually recommends going, don't, you shouldn't go into the field because you want to be an astronaut. You should do something that you love because it's really hard to be an astronaut, right? So you need to make sure you're actually going to be going into a field that you will be able to do even if you don't do that. So the reason why I say that is for NASA um, and at JPL, we have people, we have 5,000 employees. There are people with math degrees, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, business, economics, you know, all types of, you know, I know an engineer on Curiosity who got his degree in economics and is like one of the engineers on Curiosity. Um, so the point is you should, you should try to go into a field that you really enjoy um, learning the concepts of versus like, oh, I want to be this job, so I need this, you know. Um, for example, my degree is in physics. I'm doing systems engineering. I'm not doing the thing that I study. Um, of course, that will depend on sp some specialties require you to get a PhD in, for example, robotics, right? JPL is one of the leading robotics in institutions in the world, and that group requires PhDs in robotics. But for the most part, you should go into an area that you will find interesting because maybe you will not end up in the company you think you would be in, right? I didn't know I would want to go into NASA. I, I didn't know I was going to be in NASA when I got physics. I didn't know yet. So you should find, <clears throat> you should find a subject that you really like. Um, but physics is good because it, it establishes a good foundation. So I would recommend physics. Um, before the next question, is it okay if you state your name Una, before the question? Hi, uh, good afternoon. I'm uh, Pascal Pam and uh, taking Mekang here in UPD. And uh, I, I have two questions. First, uh, uh, these past few months have been really exciting. We're seeing lots of new stuff like reusable space, or, uh, reusable rockets, uh, Juno spacecraft. I want to ask you, what are you excited for in the near future in space technology or, in, or maybe in Philippine space technology? And uh, two, uh, do you play Kerbal Space Program? Do I play what? Is that uh, a game? 
It's like a space uh, simulator. I right? I heard lots of guys in NASA play this. Oh so yeah. Video game. I don't know. There are a lot of people playing Pokemon Go. So <laughs> it was kind of funny. Um, so I don't know what game you're referring to. So I do not play that. Um, but it was funny because when Pokemon Go came out, we were at a conference on the other side of the U.S. and after dinner, I took a bunch of pictures of my co coworkers who are older than me, and they're just looking for Pokemon. Grown engineers looking for Pokemon, but you know it's it's a fun thing to do. Um, your first question about what I'm excited about, I think the, the biggest thing I'm excited about is getting a human to Mars, and that's what NASA is working on. Um, we're trying to get a human to Mars in the 2030s, and it's not just NASA. You know, there are other organizations out there that are trying. Um, there are there are companies that are trying to send people just to fly by Mars and come back, or send people to Mars one way and never come back. Or, so um, so we, we're, we're still a far away, what you saw on the Martian. Um, it is, we're at the beginning stages of that, but hopefully one day we can send a human to Mars. Outside of that, um, we always talk about Mars, right? Because it's, it's the closest planet, but there are a lot of interesting bodies in the solar system, like Europa, which is a um, the moon of Jupiter or Enceladus, which have ocean under underwater oceans. So you know we think that there could be life there too. So hopefully NASA or any space agency can also explore those other bodies to see what else is out there, not just Mars. Although Mars is cool, but you know that's also what I'm excited about. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Mia, and I'm currently taking a uh, BS Geology. So uh, you said a while ago that uh, the landing site resembled the Grand Canyon we have here on Earth. So I would, beyond that, I would like to know if you know the specific geologic aspects, let's say rock composition or surrounding elevation of the landing site that made it safe enough for the rover. So I don't know all the specifics, but I can tell you that whenever we choose a landing site, that process also takes years. For example, for 2020, we've, we started that two years ago. So every year we'll come together with the science community. Um, and so to simplify this, um, there's two camps, right? There's science, so they want to see the interesting part of the landing site. And there's engineering, which is how safe it is. Usually they don't agree, right? Because the safest place is the flattest place. And it's kind of boring, right? So we have to find a balance between interesting science and places safe to land. So Gale Crater was good from a scientific point of view because of the layers, but also good for landing because um, it was lower on Mars. So the, more, the lower it is on Mars, the more time we have to react during EDL, the more time we can use the atmosphere to slow down. And so usually landing sites that are much lower are more beneficial for, for engineering purposes. So it just so happened that that was a good balance of you know, the layers for geologists, but also the, the height from the ground for, for EDL. Hi, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Miggy from the College of uh, Engineering. Uh, my question is, like, how do you see drones, oh, excuse me, not drones, um, the rovers developing in the future? And, you know, anything like really cool, like flying stuff, like, like drones or something, or like manned, uh, manned sort of rovers? on Mars, and secondly, like, what would it take to build a colony on Mars? Thank you. So for the rovers going, um, I, I think you're saying drones, I think I'm allowed to say this, but it was being proposed that um, we would have a helicopter on the next rover, um, but it's, I don't, it's not final yet, and, um, but hopefully in the future, whether it's this rover or the next one, it'd be cool to have like a drone that, that's paired with the rover. So that would be really cool. Um, your second question was about, what was your second? Oh, colony. Yes, colony. So um, I, I, my last, the last class I took was human space flight. And the thing that I realized after taking this class was we have a long way to go, <laughs> um, technology-wise, right? And also psycho psychologically as well. Um, things in the Martian where you know, we can't breathe the air on Mars, so we need you know, things that will generate oxygen for us things that will help us sustain food, like, you know, we can't plant potatoes on Mars yet, but we have um, the International Space Station, right? And astronauts have planted lettuce on this International Space Station and have eaten that. So there's a lot involved um, generating water. Um, we also need um, rovers, because when we're exploring Mars as humans, 
we're limited by our oxygen and water resources. So if we have rovers that, that could carry those with us, our habitats, um, we also have to think about the return trip, right? On the Martian, they had the Mars Ascent Vehicle, the MAV. So usually a smart strategy is to send the MAV before we send the humans. So if something goes wrong, you can go back. There's a lot involved. Um, I think one of the biggest things that people probably don't realize is the psychology, right? Just imagine being in like a really small room for eight months with like four people, you know, like <laughs> even if you're married to this person, I, I don't know. But, um, but little things, right, you take for granted like a small plant, right? There are studies that show, because um, there are um, remote bases on Earth like in Antarctica or just in Houston where they're simulating environments for astronauts to see how well they will do. Just putting one little plant really helps, right? Because, you know, you don't take, look, there's a plant right there. Like, it just psychologically, you don't know there it's there, but it helps. Um, and one more thing, um, astronaut Scott Kelly recently came back, and he was in space for almost a whole year, International Space Station. So that was a huge accomplishment. And so we're slowly getting there. Um, I think there's still te technological developments that we're missing and psychological aspects we still need to understand and, you know, do better with. So good afternoon. I am Ladnil Garcia. I am currently taking up applied physics. And I saw this picture of curiosity lately that it had holes in its wheels. So my question is, what would the team do if you know the situation arises that there will be major damage to curiosity? Good research. Uh, yes, yeah, so we started noticing the wheels getting uh, damaged I don't know, maybe less than a year ago. Um, and that was because we were driving through terrain that we did not expect. So immediately, when anything happens on the rover, whether it's hardware or software, there are what we call tiger teams. So a group of experts in that area that go off and like, what happened or what can we do, blah, 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 blah. So there's, since then, you know, they've understand why this happened. And they've done hours and hours and hours of testing on the Mars yard and in another institution in the States. and. So um, there's two things happening. One, for curiosity, um, we have put restrictions on where we can drive. So we can see where we're going. We can be like, no, we can't drive there, you know, or we can drive there. So the team has been maneuvering through terrain that we know we can drive through. So the, the, the wheels, it's more precautionary. And so we know the wheels will last for much longer, actually much longer than the pictures you see with the holes. Um, during the lifetime testing, it was already getting stripped off and like, only like half or so of the wheel was, left, was still left and it was still functioning. So with, together with the precautionary um, trails, we'll be fine. For 2020, now we know that, we're beefing up the wheels. We're changing the design, making it stronger, changing the way it's shaped a little bit. And so, of course, we want to make sure, we, have, we want to learn from the lesson from curiosity. Um, hello, sir. Hi, I'm Matthew and I'm under the program of EC. And I'm just wondering if, is it really true like we see in the movies or like some websites or news states that the government is covering some data from NASA, like if the, the, if the, the data you recover is like, like they're aliens from outer space or like that. Um, I'm just really curious about that. Sure, so um, NASA, I, I can't speak for other agencies. NASA is a public government. NASA is funded by the U.S. government. The U.S. government is funded by the people. So for NASA-specific projects, everything's public. As soon as we know, soon thereafter, the public knows. We're not, we don't hide anything. Now, things in the military are private, right? So I don't know if there's something out there that I'm, you know. But everything I know, you can ask me, and I will tell you. Um, and same thing with people at NASA. Although NASA does, um, the military or special agencies contract with NASA personnel. For specific projects, and there could be secrets there too, but people have clearances. I'm not on those projects, but I have co-workers at JPL that work on those projects, and they can't tell me anything. But for the most part, if it's a NASA project, it's public information. It's, NASA doesn't hide anything. I can't speak for like the Area 51s or whatever. So. Uh, hello, my name is Prince. I'm a mechanical engineering student. Uh, I have two questions. One, uh, from a design standpoint, how long is the 
expected lifespan of the Curiosity rover. And uh, second is, wait, I forgot my second question. Just answer the first question. The first question. So usually we know how long we're supposed to, we're contracted at first to operate the mission. And so we do testing for a lot more than just that. Um, Curiosity's prime mission was one Mars year, which is about a little under two Earth years. And so we, we did testing to make sure it lasts you know, at least you know, two or three times that. Um, also, in 2003 or 2004, the Spirit and Opportunity rovers, they were supposed to operate for three months. And until this day, 10 years later, one of them is still going. So all, all I'm going to say is, um, I don't know what the expected lifespan is, but it will not be limited based on like the power source, right? We have a nuclear power source, which will last for a very long time. It will be limited to the pieces of, pieces of hardware. Say, for example, the wheels. If we didn't take care of the wheels, that would be the first thing to go, or just mechanisms in general. So I don't know the exact time. Who knows? You know, but I think it'll be for a very long time, for curiosity. And the uh, second question is, um, during, during the flight from Earth to Mars, were there any modifications done with the Mars Curiosity rover? Like, I mean, uh, for example, I mean, is uh, changing tire pressure or uh, calibrating certain uh, mechanical components or cameras inside the... Yes. So that's a good question. Um, there's, there's nothing really... We can't really move anything during the travel to space, but there are a lot of... I would, we did modifications flight software-wise, so if we wanted to update some software on the rover or um, kind of fine tune how we're going to do entry, descent, and landing. Um, also, throughout the journey, we want to make sure that the instruments still work. So we can turn them on, but they're not moving. We just know that it's, you know, it's with the switch and it's on. So we do, we do those type of things. But also we have software errors that sometimes happen. So we have to send a new set of flight software and fix it. So those type of things, but not hardware related, right? We can't like, like the wheels are actually, there's no error. It's just a solid piece of aluminum. You know, but but the point is that you know we do testing with software related things. Uh, hi, I'm Alia. Uh, may I just ask why you use the sky crane thing rather than like another parachute like what they did with Spirit and Opportunity? Um, yeah, so um, Spirit and Opportunity also had parachutes, um, but what you're probably thinking about is they also had airbags. I don't know if you guys seen this, but after the parachute, the rover, there are a lot of airbags that, that deploy and it kind of bounces on the surface. So for Curiosity, Curios Curiosity is way bigger, way more massive, and the airbags were not going to work. So they had to innovate. There were several concepts before the sky crane, but eventually that's what it came down to, which is the sky crane concept, which is very crazy. Um, last three questions. Three questions. Uh, Nakatagalo po ba kayo? Yes, konti. Okay, yun. <laughs> Pala eh. Pinapaan. Uh, si Paul po, a geology student at uh, staff member ng siyensya. Uh, matanong ko lang po, kasi nabanggit ng Scientific American na yung US ay masyadong tutok sa Mars. Imagine, may dalawa na silang robot doon, balak man lang padala, ipadala yung Mars Insight, yung seismic yata yun. Tapos itong Mars 2020 rover, Bakit hindi na lang po sa Europa nakatutok yung NASA? Kasi yung Mars, ang dami nang nakatutok dyan. Kay China at sa kay EU, may balak na silang ipadalang mga uh, ano. So why, why does not, uh, bakit hindi mag ng groundbreaking na mission ang NASA sa Europa na hindi pa na-explore? Kasi so far, pare-pareho naman yung lumalabas na resulta eh. May tubig dyan dati, walang buhay. Tubig dyan dati, walang buhay. Pare-pareho right. lang. So what's new? <laughs> so I think I answered that a little bit earlier. Um, I, wanted, I definitely want to go back to Europe, go to Europa and Enceladus. Um, but something to keep in mind is that we are working on that. It's not just Mars. Um, JPL does exploration for all the bodies. And so the Europa mission is actually currently being built, or going through concept. Um, there are different phases of a project. And so um, there's a whole team of engineers, one floor above where I work, that are working on Europa. They're working on the Europa spacecraft. Um, and there are other teams working on concepts to get to other places, not just Mars. But I think there's a focus on Mars. Um, once again, not just Mars, there's other projects. 
Um, it's because we eventually want to send humans there, and it's a natural place to go because it's the closest. Tapos, uh, may kinalaman na rin sa China, nabanggit ko na rin lang, uh, di ba may batas ang Kongreso ng US na pinagbabawal ang NASA na makipag-cooperate sa Chinese government? Eh, ang tawag dito, wala, yung NASA ba, sa, bukod sa technological expertise, wala na ba silang ibang magagawang paraan para makipag-cooperate sa China, which, is, which we all know is a rising space power? So, um, in The Martian, that's what, have you get the movie The Martian, that was really cool, right? How we, in the movie, the Chinese help the Americans. Uh, that was really, you know, I, I don't know exactly what the policies are between America and the U.S., but it is unfortunate that countries like other countries, we are kind of prohibited to work with them, but other countries, we work with them, you know. A lot of the instruments on the Curiosity rover come from other countries. So I don't know what the politics are like, but hopefully one day, we can all come to an agreement that space exploration is a human thing, right? Not not a country thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Izzy from uh, Film Microsat Project and also uh, MS Energy Engineering. Yes, uh, I'm very curious about the nuclear power that's being used for curiosity. Yeah. Since uh, nuclear is very dangerous, especially if it explodes, that 2.5 mil billion thing or million thing, dollar thing would just explode. Uh, what were the considerations taken and how does that nuclear power work for curiosity? What, what, uh, what are the elements used? So I'm not a nuclear engineering expert, but I could try to answer your question. And they actually guide us to not answer these questions. But I will say, um, so it's nuclear powered, plutonium. Plutonium um, radioactively decays. When it decays, it creates heat. And we can use that heat to generate um, energy to power our batteries. Um, there is a whole organization that is responsible for making sure that precautions are, take, are, are made to make sure it doesn't harm Earth, right? Um, or the rover, especially Mars, right? There are planetary protection rules to make sure that we will not contaminate Mars. But also people are always worried, some people are worried when we launch nuclear spacecraft from Earth, you know, like during the launch, something can happen and like it comes back down to Earth. So there's a whole organization that kind of deals to make sure that we will be fine something does happen. It, there's, I, I'm, I don't know that process, but I know there's a lot involved with a lot of signatures involved all the way up the chain. So rest assured, we should be fine. Um, oh, oh, okay, last question. Um, good afternoon. My name is Camille from, <laughs> from UP Astronomical Society. I'm just curious as to what you do with the other equipments or materials that you send to Mars. Like, do you leave it there? I'm just um, concerned about whether it's going to contaminate the planet or not. Okay, good question. We've never brought anything back from Mars. So whenever we send a satellite or a rover, it just stays there. Um, but part of the landing site selection is making sure that if something happened that we threw away our hardware, that it wouldn't cause any contamination problems. So they all stay there, and we just have to keep track of where everything goes. Um, for example, during entry, descent, and landing, you know, the rover is here, but we also know where the parachute is going to end up, and this X, Y, and Z. So we, we know where things are on the surface of Mars, and we make sure we take care and understand that it's okay for those items to be there. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, yun na yung mahamodate natin questions. Pero thank you to everyone who gave out their questions. And of course, thank you to Engineer Gregory for answering their quest our questions. And so, um, yun, lap na tayo. <laughs> <laughs> and also, of course, to show our appreciation for um, Engineer Gregory for giving out his time. Um, May I call on um, Dr. Randy Cajote, our Deputy Director for Student and Alumni. Um, to give our um, simple memento. So, we'd like to give a, some simple souvenirs on behalf of the University of the Philippines, Mr. Gregory Villar, for his very exciting talk on uh, moving the joystick. So, this is from the University of the Philippines. <laughs>